All right, my mother's the artist behind the picture on the front. And uh, we're going to hook this thing up to me. Okay, and there's uh, two different forms. She's got this one that has color on it, and then there's one in black and white. Which one do you Which one do y'all like? The color, or the black. Color? You like the color one? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. We're turning your Bibles to First John one nine. First John one nine. Now, last week we studied salvation and eternal... Well, actually, the week before last we studied salvation. Then last week we studied eternal security, so now we're going to move on to the most important uh, function as uh, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. The most important thing to understand is 1 John 1, 9. <clears throat> so, uh, the next few moments are going to be devoted to silent prayer giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood in order that you might uh, name your sins to God so that you can uh, restore your fellowship and God the Holy Spirit will enlighten you and bring to your memory all things as God the Holy Spirit is our teacher and our mentor. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to live in a nation of freedom, a nation where we can assemble ourselves together without threat of harm from our government. Uh, thank you for letting us live under this freedom to where we might uh, be able to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And may the things that we note today uh, edify our souls so that we might grow in grace and glorify you, the very purpose for which we are alive on this earth. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now there are 10 billion neurons in the brain when we're born. At the point of birth, we have 10 million billion neurons, and then uh, those neurons are available to have uh, information printed on them. And in the case of uh, learning the Word of God and uh, through the filling of God the Holy Spirit, we have Bible doctrine available to be printed on those neurons. Now, as you get older, neurons uh, begin to die off. And that means there is a, a great importance for repetition. And repetition is important because as those neurons die off, you tend to forget things. And that's why uh, older people uh, sometimes become senile or they start to suffer from dementia. It's because those neurons are starting to die off. And so it is very important when you learn the Word of God that you have repetition because it's like bolting on top of those neurons. I work in uh, word processing and when you want to make a point, you bold it. You put bold on it. And therefore, by repetition, it's like uh, going over those neurons twice, it uh, makes it uh, bold, and therefore it fades away much uh, slower. So the rate of uh, learning must always exceed the rate of forget forgetting in some of your writing, and that's a, a, a good point. The rate of learning must exceed the rate of forgetting, and that's because as we get older, and uh, especially when we move into old age, our memories can fail us, and uh, Colonel R.B. Thame, who uh, is a genius, and in my mind, I know he is a genius, studying uh, some of the things that he's come up with, a, a definite genius. Uh, now he, he's uh, having trouble with his memory, and uh, but he's still trying to think of the Word of God, but he's having trouble with that, and that happens often when we get older through diseases like Alzheimer's and a lot of times if you have a stroke it will destroy those neurons or if you're a wild person in your youth and you decide to do drugs well you're going to destroy a lot of neurons from those drugs and while it feels good uh, at the moment once you get older you're going to uh, start to have uh, memory problems and probably some psychological problems and these things you don't want to mess with and also excessive alcohol. And notice I say excessive. 
uh, because uh, drinking a little wine for your stomach's sake, as the Bible says, is okay. But to uh, that is, if you're old enough, if you're young, don't mess with the stuff. Wait till you're old. You'll, you'll end up in jail if you touch it. Believe me, I know. Okay. So. What you do is, uh, when you're older and mature enough, you can have a glass of wine, um, but don't overdo it. That will affect the neurons, and uh, excessive alcohol will just destroy those neurons, and then you'll start to have all kind of problems like insomnia and other things from um, excessive alcohol use. So we see uh, in 1 John 1, 9, which is where you have your Bibles opened, uh, sandwiched right in between that is 1 John 1, 8 and 1 John one ten. Now, First John was written to believers. These are people who have already believed in our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore, First John is telling us in First John one eight and First John one ten that all of us sin. Uh, none of us are immune to sin. If you think you don't sin, you're you're crazy. We all sin. Now, that's not. I'm not trying to excuse away sin. We shouldn't uh, want to sin, and and. Uh, we should try to avoid it, but the fact is we're going to because within us is an old sin nature. We were born with it, and because we believe in Christ, it does not eliminate our old sin nature. We're going to sin. And um, a lot of times what's happened now in uh, Christianity is a guilt reaction. Every time you sin, you're going to have a guilt reaction, and that's going to cause some serious problems in your life. And a lot of people blow their heads off because of guilt. And then they're Christians. They believed in Christ, and they do something that shocks them, and therefore they uh, can't deal with it, and they think of themselves as being horrible people, and they end up um, killing themselves because they have uh, harbored guilt for so long. There's no need for that because uh, God has given us a system to overcome all these things. He's in grace. He's done this. And through 1 John 1, 9, which states, if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. And note that it says name. It doesn't say, well, your Bible might say confess. Well, that means to name or to cite your sins. And it does not say you have to feel guilty about them. In fact, um, feeling guilty about them would be, um, now when you sin, let me clear this up, when you sin, you might have a guilt reaction to it. And that might bring you to the point where you say, I need to name this sin to God. And in that case, it, it's kind of like a motivator. But once you name that sin to God, you are to disregard it. In other words, uh, if you feel guilty for that sin after you name it, well, you're going right back into sin because, in essence, you're saying Christ did not do enough on the cross. He did not uh, die as a substitute for my sins. And therefore, you are not believing the promise of Scripture, First John one nine, is not a promise; it's a process, and it's a system. But you're not believing it, and therefore uh, you immediately go back out of fellowship. So guilt is uh, a problem for Christians, and a lot of people go through uh, guilt, and it's not a it's not a good thing. Now it might motivate you to rebound, as in the case of the Corinthians, where they needed to feel guilty about what they were doing. Uh, that is, before they rebounded because they were in, involved in some terrible things. And so they had a guilt reaction. That's in 1 Corinthians where they say a godly sorrow. Well, godly is not supposed to, God's not supposed to be a, a, an adjective like that. That's a mistranslation. But that godly sorrow that they're talking about in 1 Corinthians is simply uh, they realize what fools they've been and therefore they change their mind and name their sins and uh, move on with their life. <clears throat> Now, I watched the Super Bowl. Was it last week? I don't know. I was, I was so busy this week. I'm tired, very tired. Um, I watched the Super Bowl last week. Now, McNabb, poor fella, he uh, threw the ball to this guy, and it was maybe a 40-yard pass, and the guy was standing out of bounds. And what that means is, and in terms of our spiritual life, if we're out of bounds, and that means if we're in a state of sin, no matter how far we run in the energy of the flesh, maybe we witness to 100 people, uh, maybe we listen to 50 tapes in a day, maybe, maybe we're doing all of this uh, in the energy of the flesh, but if you're out of bounds, that means if you're under the control of the sin nature, you are not going to advance. Uh, you can run 40 yards and you're out of bounds. So the guy, he catches the ball, here it comes 40 yards out, and he jumps. 
he catches the ball and he lands out of bounds. And uh, he's excited, but he doesn't know he's out of bounds. And then uh, they have to start all the way back uh, where they left off at whatever yard line they were at. So uh, in terms of uh, in basketball, the same thing. You throw a ball out of bounds, you've got to start all over. And the way to do that in the Christian way of life, when you sin, and we all sin, and whatever sin that is, you uh, simply name it to God, and that's his grace provision for us to get back in the game. And so we need to be in the game of the protocol plan of God, and that's a big word, protocol plan of God. But eventually you'll understand these things if you stick with it. So let's take down some points about 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9. Now I'm going to call this rebound. My pastor <coughs> called it rebound. I'm going to call it rebound because it explains what's going on. It's like rebounding in a... Uh, some type of football game or a basketball game. So point one, rebound or utilization of 1 John 1, 9 is the first and most important problem-solving device for the Christian way of life. Now when we believe in Christ, we have a life to live and that's the Christian way of life. And God hasn't left us out here to just float around and uh, do things in the energy of our own flesh or what have you. So he's given us a system to follow. And therefore, that's why 1 John 1, nine is available to us. And it's a problem-solving device in that when you name your sins, you are filled with God, the Holy Spirit. And that's why it tells us in Ephesians to be habitually filled with God, the Holy Spirit, because he is our mentor and our teacher. And when you're learning the Word of God, God the Holy Spirit will teach you these things, which in the Greek is called pneumatikos, and that means it's spiritual phenomenon. An unbeliever can't understand the things I'm telling you, and uh, a believer out of fellowship in carnality would not be able to understand this because this is spiritually discerned, and therefore you can only learn these things uh, from the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So rebound, 1 John 1, 9, is the first and most important problem-solving device in the Christian way of life. Point two, without the foundation of rebound, that is 1 John 1, 9, the other nine problem-solving devices, you might have never heard of a problem-solving device. Well, a problem-solving device are those things God has given to us as the believer so that we can uh, operate in our spiritual life. And if you stick with it, you will come to understand the other nine. But without the foundation of rebound, the other nine fall apart. It's like uh, building a house. If you build it on sand, it's going to fall apart. So you can think of the sand as uh, the sin nature. It's uh, shifting and changing, and, uh, and therefore the house will not stand. You can't build your spiritual life from the energy of the flesh. And rebound is the most important problem-solving device because it puts you back into fellowship. Point three, rejection of rebound as a problem-solving device means complete rejection of the unique spiritual life. If you reject 1 John 1, 9, and there are uh, a lot of pastors don't even know what uh, the importance of 1 John 1, 9, and uh, some pastors even reject it. They say naming your sins, oh, you don't need to name your sins. Uh, you can just have a faith experience and or some uh, odd mystical thing that uh, I don't understand it. I, I, I can't understand pastors that would never teach First John 1, 9 because uh, it's the foundation for your spiritual life. You cannot, if you're in a state of sin, you can't learn anything. So the rejection of rebound, is this is point four, the rejection of rebound is a problem-solving device means rejection of, God, of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Now in Ephesians 4.30 it says stop grieving the Holy Spirit. And the, how do you do that? You do that by using 1 John 1.9 because uh, through sin we grieve and uh, quench and squelch the Holy Spirit. And in fact I forgot to give you the uh, three points on what uh, we do when we sin. Uh, first of all, when you sin, you can lie to God the Holy Spirit. This happened in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, and this is Acts 5.3, and that's lying to the Holy Spirit. What they did is uh, they were in competition with their fellow uh, churchgoers, and uh, Barnabas had dropped off a load of money, every bit of it, everything he ever owned, he dropped off at the church, 
and he was going to go with Paul. Barnabas was going to go with Paul, and he said uh, that was part of his faith rest drill. He said, I'm going to go on this mission with Paul. I'm giving him all this money, and uh, I'm going to rely on the Lord to uh, uh, bless us in this ministry, and the Lord did. But then Ananias and Sapphira saw what uh, he had done, and they became jealous because he got a lot of praise for it. And he didn't uh, need the praise, or he didn't even deserve the praise, but he got it from church members, and they said, that was a wonderful thing you did, Barnabas. Well, Ananias and Sapphira in the church, uh, they got jealous. They said, well, look at this guy. I could be, and they thought to themselves, I got a lot more money than this guy. I got a lot more land. I could uh, sell my land and give even a bigger pile of money to the Apostle Paul, and then people will respect me in the church. So they had their eyes on people, and that's a problem in the Christian way of life. You get your eyes on people. Now you have friends and loved ones, and that's fine. But if uh, you uh, love them more than you love the Lord, in other words, if you let them mess up your spiritual life, then uh, you're failing. So you should um, understand these these things. Excuse me, and therefore. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira, they uh, decided to do this thing, and they said, well, we're going to sell all of our land and uh, give the money to the Apostle Paul. And they did so, and they went up to Paul, and they said, this is all of it, all of everything, but yet they had held back some. Now, the fact that they held back some was not uh, the issue. They, they didn't even have to give. That's not the point. They didn't have to give a dime, and they would, and they would have been fine. The the fact was they were lying. They were doing it out of uh, ambition, competition with other believers. So they uh, said, "This is all of the money," but they lied. They had held back some, and they didn't have to do that. They could have said, "I'm giving uh, 50." They didn't even have to tell how much they were giving, but they could have said, "This is 50 percent of the profit I made on this, and we're going to keep the other half because we need it. And that would have been fine. That's not the point. The point is they lied about it for attention. They wanted to say, we gave it all up and we're relying on the Lord just like uh, Barnabas did, but they weren't, and therefore they dropped dead. They went in and saw Peter, and they dropped dead. And that story is found in Acts 5.3, if you want to look it up later and read it. It's quite interesting. So we have lying to the Holy Spirit. Then we have, point two, grieving the Holy Spirit. And that's found in Ephesians 4.30. That's Ephesians 4.30. And then you have quenching the Holy Spirit. And that's found in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Quenching the Holy Spirit is found in 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Now, if we did not have 1 John 1.9, we would live out our lives grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. That is because we would always live under sin. And therefore, we have the function of rebound. So, uh, I know we just had a diversion. But point five under the rebound study part, uh, rejection of rebound means that all production, that is all of what you consider your good works, all the times that you spent in Bible class, all of your energy of the flesh is con converted into wood, hay, and stubble. And that uh, conversion into wood, hay, and stubble, that will actually be burned at the judgment seat. Now, you won't be burned. You're a believer. You'll be saved. But all these works that you did outside of fellowship uh, means that uh, it's for nothing. It's for naught. You gave everything to the poor. Well, if you're uh, not filled with God, the Holy Spirit, and you're giving to the poor as a good work, that means nothing. That will be burned as part of wood, hay, and stubble. Yet, if you were to uh, give to the poor and you were in fellowship and you were uh, having some uh, gift of helps or something like that, and you help somebody out, and you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, well, that is refined gold, and that will be part of the rewards you receive in the eternal state, along with the escrow blessing you receive on earth. Not that you're blessed for what you do, you're not. That's not the point I'm making. You are blessed in the spiritual life by growing in grace and in knowledge. That's what you're blessed for. You're not blessed for the things that you do. I don't want you to get confused on that. And point six, rebound is not a license to sin. Now, a lot of people, uh, especially here in the South, actually all around the country, if you tell them all you have to do, brother, is name your sins. When you, uh, you've believed in Christ and you've messed up, you committed a horrible sin, you've shocked yourself. You're shocked by what you've done. And therefore, all you have to do is 
name your sins and you'll be forgiven. And that, that to them that sounds simple. They want to wallow around in guilt for a while. They want to do that. But the, you're a royal priest. Do you know that when you believe in Christ, you become royalty? There's no place for royalty to wallow around in guilt. That is not our standing. We're royalty. We don't wallow around in guilt. What we do is we name our sins and we uh, know that the Lord will forgive us our sins. We know that from 1 John 1, nine. We know it. So you have to know something about Scripture. And uh, stop wallowing around in guilt. What good is it? You feel guilty all the time. You think God is impressed by your guilt? Not at all. God is not impressed by your guilt. God wants you to follow what he says. So to obey him is to obey 1 John 1, nine. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just. What's that mean? He's faithful. That means he'll do it every time. It, you say, well, I commit this one sin over and over again. I do it all day. Let's, uh, let's pick out one sin. Gossip. I like to pick on that sin because I don't like gossip. I work with uh, women, all women. I'm the only guy in there. And women, they know how to gossip. It's it's one of the strangest things working with women because uh, as soon as another lady walks out of the room, they're all ladies. One lady gets up and goes to the bathroom. Well, automatic, automatically, oh, did you know? What? Do you know about her? How about, how about? And as soon as she walks back in the room, they're like, oh, hey, you're back. <laughs> It's the, it's the most phenomenal thing I've ever seen. And gossip, by the way, is a sin. Well, they're not shocked by that. They don't live in guilt all day because they've been gossiping. They probably don't even know it's a sin, but it is. Gossip is a sin listed in the Bible. And yet, if they were to do something, like my boss, for example, she hates drunks. She uh, grew up around drunks. She lets that be known. She grew up around it. She hated it because it did cause problems in her life. And so she hates drunks. So let's say this uh, last Super Bowl weekend she went out and got drunk. Well, she would feel guilty, very guilty the next day because uh, she had been uh, been down on drunks her whole life. Let's say she went out and got drunk on Super Bowl night. Well, she would feel guilty about it, yet she's gossiped all this time. She never felt guilty about that. That's because we have an area of strength and an area of weakness. Now, some of us would never think about going out and getting drunk, fornicating, or whatever. But uh, some of you, but those same people, would uh, spend all their time gossiping and maligning about somebody else. Well, it's sin. Gossip and maligning is sin. Yet, you might not, not think about gossiping and maligning somebody. You might think about going out and raising hell. So, it's just two different categories, two different areas of weakness. Uh, you have an area of weakness. We all do. The Apostle Paul had an area of weakness. His area of weakness was the uh, gossip, maligning, judging part. That's what he was as an unbeliever. And he followed the law to a T. And yet uh, he ended up murdering Christians. And then, uh, of course, he was breaking the law by doing that. So uh, the Apostle Paul said he was the greatest of all sinners. And that was under the uh, the fact that he was judging every everybody. Under the and he lived the mosaic. He was a genius, and when he learned the law, he lived it to a T. But uh, he still had an old sin nature, separated from God, without anything to do about it. Therefore, the only way to wake the apostle Paul up was to blind him for three days, and then he realized uh, he needed to believe in Christ. So many churches today. If you go to church today, and uh, let's say you go up to your pastor, you say, Pastor, I feel so horrible about what I did this past weekend. And, of course, the, that kind of pastor said, what would you do? He wants to hear about it. What would you do? <laughs> and uh, so uh, then you tell him, and he says, well, my goodness, that is awful. <laughs> so I wouldn't have told that if I was you. But then, uh, so then he says, well, what should I do, pastor? And he says, well, I tell you what, I'd feel sorry for doing something like that. I uh, feel sorry for your sin. And, uh, and then ask God for forgiveness. Now, 1 John 1, 9 does not say to ask God for forgiveness. Now, this is a common misconception. You think you sin, you say, uh, Father, please forgive me, I've sinned. Well, you don't, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is name the sin. He knows you've sinned. God's not a fool. He knows what you've done to ask for forgiveness, say, forgive me. Well, you don't really do that. What you do is follow the procedure. It says, name your sins. If you name your sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, growing up spiritually, there was a time I probably asked God, I said, God, forgive me. Well, that's not the way to do it. You say, uh, Father, I have done thus and so. Father, I got drunk or whatever. 
and then you're forgiven. He's faithful and just to forgive you that sin. And he's faithful means he'll do it every time. It don't matter if you, let's say, uh, like the people I work with, if you gossip every five minutes, let's say you gossip about somebody, you get a big chuckle out of them, and then you say, oops, I've sinned. And so you name that sin. Then five minutes later, you catch yourself doing it again. So you name it again. And then you think, well, God's going to get tired of forgiving me. No, he's faithful. <laughs> and uh, so therefore... First uh, John one nine lets it be known that God is faithful, and isn't that a relaxing thing to know? All you have to do is name your sins. You don't have to wallow around in guilt, and that's the way God wants it. God wants us to live a relaxed life. He doesn't want us to be all in tied up in knots, worried about every little thing. My goodness, that would be a horrible life. We're royal family of God. God designed us to live a happy life. He doesn't want us to wallow in misery and in guilt. And yet so many of us do that at times when we uh, commit a sin that shocks us. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and, uh, okay, now commit sin, smile about it, just name it. No, you are punished as a child of God if you do so. You, your desire should be to learn the Word of God and to come to understand these things and to come to understand the peace, the wonderful peace you receive in your soul from learning doctrine. Now, I spent this week, I've got four hours up here of uh, Bible tapes. Now, I've been working eight and a half hours a day, and I get home, and I study some more. This is, this is, I'm trying to show you how important these things are. They're very important, and I'm very tired. But they're very important to know all of these things. And so I get home, and I study sometimes up till 12 and 1 o'clock, go to sleep and get up and go back to work. And that's what I've been doing day after day. And yesterday I wrote this pamphlet. It took me all day to write this. I don't know why. It's so little. I was, ex <laughs> I was expecting systematic theology like this big. But instead I got this. All that work. But this is important. And in fact, uh, it's the, the, it actually tells you everything you need to know about salvation and the fact you don't invite Christ into your heart. If you've heard that. Your pastor says invite Christ into your heart. But that's not in Scripture. It's not found. In fact, I looked through it. I looked through every bit of it through a computer program. I didn't read the whole thing. I'm not going to lie to you. I got, on the I got on the computer and typed invite, and then it looks for invite, and it wasn't there. It says, no, nope, that word doesn't exist. It didn't exist. And I said, wow, that's amazing. They tell you invite Christ into your heart. It doesn't even exist in the Bible. Now, I didn't read through the whole thing and look for it. I'd still be reading it if that was the case. So, But it does not exist. I, I trust that computer program to be correct, that invite is not in your Bible. And in fact, the, the Bible says believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ did all the work on the cross. Um, he died as a substitute for us. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, all of our sins were imputed to him. And simply by faith alone in Christ alone, you have eternal life. And not by inviting him into your heart. That Actually, you, you're not saved by doing that. And that's not in Scripture. What Scripture say? Acts 16.31 Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what Scripture says. And that's what I teach. I teach Scripture. I'm not going to make up something. Why would I want to? Why would I want to say invite Christ into your heart and make up something like that? It, it, it's stupid. I don't understand it. It's not there. Why say it? It's not in the Bible. So we have a serious problem in our country today, and what we need is a generation of people to grow in grace and in knowledge. A new generation to replace the one that's leaving. Our country will be in trouble if we have young people who aren't willing to understand these things if we have young people that want to reject these things or neglect these things then uh, you're going to be a problem for our country and this is best illustrated in how uh, juries have been handing out guilty verdicts they only hand out the guilty verdict uh, let's say uh, wh who was that Peterson guy he had uh, killed his wife and uh, had the uh, unborn fetus died he had killed his wife and uh, what happened to him? He, he's, he's, did they sentence him to death? They did, didn't they? You know why they sentenced him to death? Because he didn't cry. I heard that on television. They said, well, this Peterson guy, he's cold. Well, he didn't. When they were describing the death of his wife, he didn't even 
He didn't even shed a tear. Well, he killed her. Of course he didn't shed a tear. He's the one who did it. Now, if he were smart, boy, he could have just uh, turned that spigot on and cried because he was a good-looking man, right? He could have turned that spigot on and cried and uh, made a big scene, and all the ladies would have said, Oh, he feels sorry for what he did. And guess what? Because there was only circumstantial evidence, there was no... Uh, there was no DNA. There was no hard evidence. You know what would have happened? If he would have cried, they'd have let him go. They'd have said, no, nah, he didn't do it. Well, there was no hard evidence. It was all circumstantial. But they fried him because he looked so cold in the courtroom. So we focus in this country too much on emotion. We, In the same way, uh, if somebody commits a sin, and you want to see them feel bad about it, somebody does something wrong to you you want to you want to see them in pain you want to see them in misery you want to say this person did me wrong that person the other day in high school uh, she talked about me and she called me a whore or a slut or whatever they do and they do that in high school I'm not gonna you, you think uh, school today is innocent no it's not I was in high school not too long ago and uh, there's a I know language my parents don't know. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, uh, so the fact is, uh, you hear somebody, they say, that, well, look at how she's dressed. She's a slut. And so you uh, get mad at that person. You want that person to be in misery. You want that person to feel guilty for how they've wronged you. Uh, yet, uh, uh, these things of guilt and things, now we adjust to each other like that, but that's not how we adjust to God. God doesn't want us to see to be guilty about what we've done. He wants us to follow the procedure, which is to uh, name your sins to God. How long have I been talking? We got a lot more. We got a whole other hour after this one. So therefore, while humans are impressed with a guilt reaction or some type of regret or feeling sorry or being ashamed, God is not impressed with that nonsense. And, you know, there's a problem today in churches with humanizing God. They want to say, you know, God is not happy about what you've done, brother, what you did to that poor uh, young lady. God is not uh, too uh, pleased with you about it. You, you know God's happy all the time. For God, if God were miserable every time somebody sinned, well, he would have to be on Prozac. He'd be, <laughs> my goodness, as much as people sin, he, God doesn't, that doesn't faith. God knew about your sin in eternity past. God knew about everything you would do in eternity. He knew about all of us in eternity past. He's not upset when we sin, now, as a means of uh, describing something to us, the scripture might say, and he displeased God. That's just a way to let you know that you're out of line. But if God ran around displeased, all he would be displeased right now. So therefore, uh, he set up a system. Jesus Christ died on the cross as a substitute for us, and that's how we are justified. We're not justified based on what we can do. That's insane. We can't reach God. There's an insurmountable wall. But God has destroyed that wall by sending our Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross as a substitute for us. And therefore, when you simply believe in Christ, you receive eternal salvation. So we're going to take a look at this uh, 1 John 1, 9. And actually, rebound, what I'm teaching is what, uh, what should be called transdispensational. That means in every dispensation, this uh, problem-solving device was used. That means in the Old Testament... They uh, name their sins in the same way we name our sins. Name your sins to God. Now, they had rituals to go along with it, but that was part of a teaching tool because it's not sacrifice. It's what God desired. It's what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and David lets that be known in the Scripture. So, turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 1535. Now, we're, we're seeing here, like I said, God uses a certain... God will say, I'm displeased with you in the Scripture, and that's just His way of letting us know that we are out of line. God is never displeased. So God uses something called an anthropopathism. That's spelled A-N-T-H-R-O-P-O-P-A-T-H-I-S-M. Now, this is a technical theological term. 
uh, you won't find anthropopathism in the Bible per se as a word, but you, it's a technical term to describe what God does in terms of trying to uh, explain to us, reveal to us his plan. Now, we're humans, so we have guilt, we have emotion, uh, we have all of these things uh, that uh, cause us problems. God doesn't have them, but in order to teach us, he uh, describes something. He says, uh, for example, First Samuel 15.35, And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, repented, we've studied that in the past. Uh, in the Hebrew, uh, I believe it's Nak, is it, I believe it's Nakam in the Hebrew, I'll check that later. But in the Greek, it's metanoieo, and we studied that. And metanoieo means to have a change of mind. Here in the Hebrew, this repent means to have a change of mind. So it says the Lord repented that he had made Saul. Now, the Lord has never changed his mind about anything. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit and uh, deity, they've never changed their mind. They're immutable. Immutable means unchanging. They've never changed their mind. So why does it say here that, that the Lord changed his mind? Well, that's so we'll understand that the Lord is displeased with Saul. He was displeased with Saul as king over Israel. And the only way he can communicate to us the fact that he was displeased with the, the way Saul was running things, not that he was displeased, he was just, he was just telling us uh, Samuel is not going the way I want him to, and the way he describes that is to say he changed his mind. Well, that's an anthropopathism. God doesn't, in essence, change his mind. But in order to communicate to us, God says, I've changed my mind. So he changed his mind about Saul. So we note anthropropathism uh, shortly. I've got a lot more notes on it, but uh, that's not the subject of what we're studying. We note that uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are immutable, and that means unchanging. So we find this in regards to the Son in Hebrews 13.8, where it says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means he's immutable. Never changing. God's never changed. We change our mind all the time, especially ladies. You want to eat here? Sure. And then you get there. Oh, I changed my mind. Let's go somewhere else. And that's uh, we do that, but God doesn't. God, by the way, he does not have emotion. And uh, while God ascribes to himself uh, human characteristics in Scripture, it would be error on our part to humanize God. That's what I was getting at. I don't know why I went through that whole thing. I was getting at the fact that we humanize God. And uh, we humanize God by uh, saying, if I feel sorry for my sin, like uh, if Peterson would have cried and cried and cried, we would have forgave him. I wouldn't have. Everybody, well, that's not my place. The law is going to deal with him. But uh, in terms of Peterson, if he would have cried, the jury would have said, oh, he's innocent. Poor fella. Poor fella killed his family. So uh, they would have let him go. So then we have... Uh, God, in the same case, we say, well, you know what, if I just feel real bad and, and cry my eyes, eyes out all night long before God and tell him what a fool I am, he knows what a fool you are. You don't got to tell him that. <laughs> so you tell him all night long, and then you uh, make the stupid promise, I'll never do it again. Well, that's a lie. You're going to do it again, that's for sure. How many times? We've all done it in spiritual youth, all of us. I've done it. Say, well, God, I'll never do that thing again, <laughs> but then you end up doing it again. But he's still faithful, that, and he will still forgive you if you name your sins. So there's no point in uh, wallowing in guilt. And humanizing God means, uh, you say, if I cry my eyes, uh, eyes out all night long, God's going to forgive me. Well, God's not a human. A human might. A human will eventually have, if they're normal, will have some kind of emotional response to that and say, well, you poor thing, stop crying. You're, you're messing me up. And therefore... Uh, they say, well, you're forgiven. My goodness, get off your knees, or whatever. But uh, God uh, is not impressed by that. God says, look at, God just uh, looks at you as, uh, you, you did a stupid thing. Yeah, you did. Now you're doing a stupider thing. Why don't you follow my mandate? First John 1, 9. If we name our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Faithful meaning he'll forgive it every time. And he's just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. That means there are sins we commit we don't even know are sins. Like the, the ladies who gossip all day, they don't know that's a sin. And if they did, well, they have complete disregard for, 
for the the scriptures because they're not even trying to to cut back on it or try to stop or whatever. They just keep going and going. It's a, it's phenomenal. I can't. Anyway, let's continue. So take note, there is nothing here that says we must feel sorry for our sins. There is nothing here in 1 John 1, 1.9 that says we have to have a guilt reaction. In, fi- in fact, it's quite the opposite. There is nothing here that says we need to tell God we'll never do it again, because if you do that, you've sinned again, because you just lied. You'll do it again. And uh, that's like uh, when you spank a child. He says, Mama, I'll never do that again. And then ten minutes later, he's back in the cookie jar. So uh, don't be like little children. That's what it is. When you uh, tell God you're not going to do it again, you're being like a little child. You haven't grown up spiritually. It's time to utilize 1 John 1, nine. <clears throat> that is, name your sins simply just to name your sins to God. Let's see, i got a lot of notes here. And uh, let's talk about the procedure. If you name your sins to God, He's faithful and just to forgive you. It's a procedure. You just name it and you're forgiven. Now, if your car is running on empty and you have 200 more miles to go, there's a procedure. You pull up to the gas station, put in the, the pump, uh, fill it up, pay the guy, or put your little card in, whatever, and leave, and then your, ga- your car is filled up with gas. Now, if you're driving down the road and you say, you know what, I don't really feel like filling up. I got 200 miles to go, and uh, like my dad says, it's on empty. He goes, oh, this will go another 200 miles. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, right. So I just pull over and get gas. Forget that, I'm not going to test it. You might test it. I don't care how many miles you're getting by this point. It's time to get some gas. So if you do that and say, I don't feel like filling up, you go about uh, 50, 50 more miles, and then your car runs out of gas, and then you you have a reaction. You feel bad. Well, golly, I should have filled up with gas. And you feel bad about it because you're out on the side of the road in a big mess, and uh, your car's on empty. Now, when you feel bad about it and you say, I should have filled up, that doesn't mean your car's going to get filled up with gas. You see, And you, you can try to feel bad about it all you want. Say, I'm going to feel really bad. I'm going to get on my knees and start crying over this. That's not going to fill your car up with gas. It's a procedure. You have to take the car to the gas station and fill it up. That's the procedure. And the procedure for the Christian when they sin is to simply name their sins to God. To weep and cry about it and get on your knees, it's not going to help. The power of the spiritual life is the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And as a result of 1 John 1, 9, we can have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Now your car needs gas. In essence, the gas is the power, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So if you don't uh, follow the procedure, you're going to run out of gas. And no matter how much you cry about it, you're not going to be able to fill up with gas. Neither will you be able to live your spiritual life. So that's the analogy I'm making. There's a procedure to everything. And um, in fact, when we name our sins, it doesn't even matter what we feel about it. In fact, you might have a big smile on your face and you say, Oh, no, uh -uh, not me. Not when I sin. I'm not going to have a smile. Have something to eat because I'm tired myself. All right. What was I talking about? Gas. First John one nine. What else do I got to say about that? <laughs> no, no, we'll keep going. There's something I got to say. I just can't remember. There's something. Oh yeah, about smiling. That's what it is. You say I'd never smile about it, sin, and then uh, rebound and smile about it while I'm telling God I just done that terrible thing. You don't think so? Well, when's the last time you heard? Uh, there's somebody you hate. All of us have had at some point somebody we've disliked. And uh, somebody said, did you hear about so-and-so? They got in a terrible accident, broke their leg. They're having a terrible time. Well, you hate them. So you smile. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, that's terrible. Well, now, you might not be smiling outwardly. You're smiling on the inside. Now, that guy got what he deserved, the creep. And that's what you think. Well, that's uh, smiling about your sin. Now, you uh, later on, you might say, you know what? That was a terrible thought I had. That was a sin. So you say, uh, Father, I committed sin of uh, anger or whatever, of, of hatred against this person. And then you're forgiven. Now, 
you did it and you had a smile on your face, didn't you? Now, of course, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about those other sins like uh, fornication. You fornicate and afterwards you got a smile on your face. Well, that's disgusting, right? Well, you, well, yeah, it's a sin and it's disgusting, but God forgives it just as he forgives hatred and everything else. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to study your word. May the things that we have uh, studied this morning be a source of blessing and challenge to us. And if you're here today without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, uh, God has uh, uh, something to say about that. And in fact, he said it by sending Jesus Christ to the cross to die as a substitute for you. And in fact, by simply believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, inaudibly, that means in your mind only, you can say, Father, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the minute of your sal- the moment of your salvation. And uh, none of us know when we're uh, going to die. Uh, we've all probably had near-death experiences. None of us know when we're going to die. It could be today, tomorrow, the next day. So if you haven't made the decision, you need to make that decision now while you're alive. So if you haven't, you can simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is the moment of your salvation. So, Father, thank you for the wonderful opportunity we had this morning to study your word. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now we can have donuts and coffee.